If you listen closely, you just might hear the sun whisper, draw near, draw near, to flowers below that straighten their spines and stretch their faces towards the light. And like that light which falls to the earth and covers us in a blanket of warmth, I see God leaning towards me, inviting my heart and beckoning my feet. Leaning down like a potter to clay, a mother to a crib, or a child to pray, saying, child, my child, draw near to me. Draw near to truth and wonder and peace. For in my bones I believe that in the beginning God came to me. And just like the sun, which day after day invites the flowers to stand and change, if you listen closely, you just might hear God say to you, draw near, draw near. So I'm excited that we get to partner with Sanctified Art this Advent season. Sanctified Art's a, a group of Divinity graduates decided that rather than go into a local church ministry, they instead uh, started a creative arts program that helps resource local congregations throughout liturgical seasons. And so I really am excited about the devotional that they have because not only is it creative, it's also informed well theologically. I think one graduated from Candler and one from Princeton. And so I'm excited about it. But the words that I hear most uh, emphatically from this video is, you just might hear God say to you, draw near, draw near. See, we're right now in the midst of God is already here, right? Because Christmas is here. Everything's been blown up. We've had our Cyber Monday, our Black Friday. Perhaps you now have a room full of presents that you're ready to start packaging and getting ready for uh, the kids or for the family and to send off to mainland or wherever they're going to go. And so many people during this Christmas season are so quick to get to, well, Christmas. Songs of joy to the world, you have Mariah Carey playing in different places, and you have people celebrating Christmas already, although we're in the midst of a time called Advent within the church. And, and it's a peculiar time because the culture around us wants to jump to Christmas already, and we, we, we have a reflective colors of purple. We wait and we pause and we say, well, not quite yet. It's the temptation to say, we're going to wait until Christmas to open your presents. At our, at our house, we have this, um, this new character that some of you may or may not know about. It's called Elf on the Shelf. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. It's a, a new thing that many families are doing. You can see it up at Target. But this little elf comes in a box, and they have like a whole movie along with it, and a book and everything. And um, the elf is kind of like the new age advent calendar. You know, so you, every day after Thanksgiving, the elf shows up in these tricky little spots. You know, this morning at my house, the elf showed up magically in the boys' bedroom with a bag of, you know, whole nuts so they could try it out on the nutcracker in our house, right? And they do all sorts of other things, and you, they'll show up in the bathroom, they'll show up hanging from the wall, and they'll show up giving presents. And, and each morning, I remember when we started to do it, um, there's one trick, though. You can't touch the elf. Because every night, the elf goes back to the North Pole and tells Santa if you're a good or bad boy, and so you, uh, a good or, good or bad girl or boy, and tell Santa, and they keep that list. So that's how Santa keeps the list of naughty and nice, is this little elf now that's in many of our family's house. So some, some of you know about it. You can ask a neighbor about the elf. And, but I remember each morning when, when the elf shows up, actually this, this year, right after Thanksgiving, it was, uh, the boys ran out of the bedroom, they had no idea, and the elf magically, of course, showed up in an obvious place. And my, my kids, their eyes, they, it opened bright, right? And they stand, <gasps> and they say, the elf is here. <laughs> and they are so excited, but they're just so surprised and curious as to why in the world and how in the world this elf magically showed up in the living room. 
And there's time after time with my kids as I, you know, watch them grow up where I recognize that they have this sense of wonder and awe at things that are new, things that are mysterious or magical. And sometimes it makes me, you know, reminisce a little bit of those times in my life. But this is what Jesus talks about within this passage. You know, you know we talk about the moving to Christmas, but Jesus wants us to have the same childlike wonder. And so rather than moving to Christ here with us, instead we begin our Advent season with a scripture that invites us to be like little children, seeing something mysterious or magical, as silly as it is for like Elf on the Shelf or whatever new experience they have. Because, I mean, imagine, think about it just for a minute. When in your life have you experienced a profound sense of wonder, of awe, of surprise that you didn't think it was possible before? A few years ago, I was reading uh, Psychology Today, and within it, they talked about the overview effect. And the overview effect is uh, a researched effect of astronauts that get the privilege of going into space and seeing the globe from outer space. And uh, one Carl Sagan talks about this experience as this humbling experience when you recognize all of the folly of human conceit and how minuscule and how big the universe is, how minuscule we are and how big the universe is. A Russian cosmonaut speaks of this same effect, this overview effect, as a unity with all of humankind. Because when you take a step back and you see the globe within this one little window, you see how closely connected all of us are on this tiny little blue dot in the universe. I can think of times in my life when I experienced a similar effect. It's a time that, and in this article, they talk about how this overview effect is life-changing for people, for the astronauts. It changes their life because of this one experience of wonder and awe that they had. I think of times when I had this sense of wonder. I remember I was living in Japan and I traveled to Kyoto by myself. And those of you who have been to that beautiful city know all of the intricacies that they put into designing and developing, whether it's the thousand golden arches that you can walk through on the hillside to the statue upon statue upon statue to the waterfall castle that they have. I was walking through that city and and wondering how is it that this people was able to do this so long ago and withstand all sorts of wind and rain. And if you know also in that space, it's an experience of meditation as well, of peace and of calm. You can go to the, the garden, the rock garden, and just watch the way they raked that Zen garden that morning. I had the privilege of studying with a monk who had studied in America, so his English was great, and I stayed at the uh, Buddhist monastery, and I was able to do a time of meditation with him, and he showed me what that was like and experienced how I can empty myself to experience the divine. The sense of wonder, of magnitude, of something completely different than myself changed me and changed my walk with God. Now, my own, one of my own grounding devotional life practices is a practice of Christian meditation. Or perhaps the time when I went to Angkor Wat, Cambodia. And some of you who know, it's one of the ancient wonders of the world. An ancient, you know, almost like Indiana Jones, had, you know, they go off to the ancient ruins and the jungle had taken over and it's massive and it's thousand years old and it's just a reminder of how people have worshipped And I stood in awe of this ancient statues after statues. And you know what it inspired me in that moment? Is as I saw the jungle creeping in, how easy it is for to let our faith become stagnant or forgotten. And the jungle can just kind of come in and take over. And what was once faithful and life-giving is now ruins. Those are two of my experiences of wonder that have changed me forever. What are your experiences of wonder? 
times in your life that you've stood in your tracks and your mouth dropped. Albert Einstein talks about it and he says that wonder, wonder is both the basis of science and of art. And he says, to those in which whom the emotion is dead of wonder, well, that person is too dead. And they're no longer able to see beyond themselves. How is it that we take time during this really, really busy time of Advent? Right? A time when we're doing our Advent parties, a time when our calendars are full, we're trying to take things off, and we feel exhausted by all the things we have to do to prepare, that we create a space for wonder. And see, you know, we like to think, or at least I like to think, that I have to go find this experience to experience wonder. That I have to go off and travel or go to a new place or go to do something different. You know, the, the first time I met God, I was at a Young Life camp in Minnesota. And I remember thinking that these people were telling me about God and telling me that I should believe in God and I hadn't believed in God. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't raised in the church. And, and I said, ah, you know, I don't know about this God. But I was given like an hour to sit by myself in the grass, because that's what everyone was given. Sit by yourself in the grass and reflect on the message they had. And I sat there, and I looked at a blade of grass. And I don't know how my mind wandered, but eventually it wandered to the blade of grass. And you know, all the little strands that come out of the center stem of that blade. And then I looked at all the blades around that one single blade of grass. And I just realized how amazing and how big everything was that God had created in that moment. And these people were telling me that God loves you so much that God knows you just as much as that blade of grass. And I thought to myself, this is so intricate and so detailed. And there's millions of them just around me. We like to go off to exotic places to experience wonder, but wonder is right there probably where you just stepped, if you look for it. The greatest scientists who know the most minute details about any random fact or thing that you can think of will tell you it becomes more mysterious as you know more about it. And I believe that's the same as with God. One would think that you go to divinity school and you come back and I can tell you all there is to know about God. But what I can tell you is that you go to divinity school and you can tell you all there is to know about how we still are learning about God who came to us in this person of Jesus. We're searching. We're drawing near to this God who has already drawn near to us. And this Advent season, I want to invite you to draw near to wonder to this time when you are left awestruck and amazed by what God has done. And it doesn't have to be a grand experience. It can be taking a moment to listen to the wind. It can be turning off your device, whatever that is. Breathing. Enjoying the, the excitement of your children when they show up to see Elf on the Shelf. <laughs> How is it that you'll draw near to wonder because I'm convinced of this, these opportunities when I've been left awestruck and in wonder were transformative and I believe that the times when I experience wonder, I experience the divine. I experience God with me. And just like the video says, God has already drawn near. And Jesus in the gospel invites us to draw near with expectation and hope that God's going to show up and leave you awestruck and in wonder and God's going to change you in that. This Advent, create a space for wonder. Amen.